I live and breathe travel. I live and breathe what I do. I was on the bridge of the QE2 with Concord in one ear, the red arrows in another, and telling the passengers what was going on. Amazing. And that was an iconic photograph. Welcome to the Brave Bold Brilliant podcast. I am here today with a true, true legend. It's a gentleman called Fred Finn. Now, Fred is the most travelled man on the planet, in yeah. the world, and holds the Guinness Book of Records for having done the most flights on Concorde. But so much more than that, because Fred is a very astute businessman, he's an absolute ambassador, public speaker, so well connected in the world with incredible people that you know as well. So yeah, there's a lot to Fred Finn, isn't there, Fred? Yes, there is. Uh, <laughs> and it's only when I talk with somebody such as you that I realise how complicated life can be or how, <laughs> how much connected I am because I wake up in the morning happy that I woke up because I'm alive at my age you could have snuffed it in your sleep so people say why are you smiling in the morning I said because I've made it through the night and then people say well you've done this and you've done that yes I have I've never took it as an ego trip mm. it's along the way yes and along the way I've got a lot of contacts and a lot of good friendships. Friendships to me is a commitment. Yeah. Because, Jeanette, if you said to me, I want a favour, I would say yes. Then I'd ask you what the favour was, because I know you wouldn't ask me something I couldn't do. Mm. So this is, this is about Fred Finn. This is what I am. It's, it's a lot of it. I like what it is, because it's human. Yeah. And I'm not an egotist and I'm not arrogant. And I'm Fred to everybody. If somebody calls me Mister, oh well, Christ, what have I done wrong? You know. So <laughs> there we are. So how the hell, Fred, do you get to be the most travelled man in the world? Because I mean, we're talking 15 million miles. We're probably more like 16 million now, aren't we? Yeah, we, were, yeah. we were talking over dinner last night, which was absolute joyful to be with you. Um, but yeah, how, how did you get to be in that position when, like, from where life started for you? Well, I suppose. How did I get to be the most travelled person in the world? Completely by accident. Not, it, wasn't, it wasn't something I set out to do like some others do and don't tell the truth about it. But my, my being the most travelled person in the world is because I had a job to do. Mm. Now, I was born under aviation uh, and it was called World War II and Canterbury, where I was born, was right under the Battle of Britain. So I, I, I grew up with Spitfires and Messerschmitts and Hurricanes, yeah? And it begins to form your life. And whilst war is a trauma to kids, as I to this day an air raid siren is what it is when the fire alarm goes mm. off, and I'm thinking now of my own nephews who have just come from Ukraine, mm. they're going to remember what's happening to them, much as I did about World War Two. So I so. can understand their feelings perhaps a little bit more than, than a lot. But you, life takes its turns. I wanted to be a cricketer. I lived and died for cricket when I was at school. And my friend Alan Elo and I were accepted on the Kent ground staff. And then my parents, in their, when I'm 16 years old, decided to move to Devon. Devon is a beautiful place, it is, and I appreciate it now. Mm. But at 16 years old, it was the most horrible place in the world for me, Exmouth. Where was Exmouth? It, it wasn't on the map that I knew. They talked in a different language to me, and they didn't have a cricket team as such, of minor counties. So my life as I knew it came to an end. And I suppose, if I look back, it was a mental health thing. In those days, people didn't talk about mental health. They either locked you up or you got on with it. So I thought, well, I don't like it here. So what do I do? I'm not going to go back to school. So I thought, I'll get a job. So I went to Montague Burton's, who were on every high street, and I got a job. And I learned how to put su suits in a rack, and how to fold suits, and, and how to measure people for suits. I did six months. Then I had enough of that, and I went next door to Curry's, and I got a job. Then I went next door to Corner Lions Corner House, and I got a job. And then I went down to British Railways, and I got a job. Mm -hmm. And from all these little things, I learnt something. Didn't realise it at the time, only later in life. But then I said, well, this is, I'm just 
messing about with myself here, going nowhere. So Exmouth in the time was a proper little dock. And there was a ship there that brought coal. So I walked onto the ship and I, I spoke to the captain and I said, I'd like a job, please. He said, what can you do? I said, I don't know what, the, what, what, what you want me to do. He said, we'll make you a deck boy. That was one quality above a bilge rat at that time. Mm. Anyway, we sailed out of Exmouth and it was a flat bottom 400 ton totally metal ship and I was seasick for the next three days. And uh, then um, I decided on the west coast of Ireland, I'd better get up here. Uh, so I caught the train, the Chorus on Perarian across Ireland. I remember the name of the train. And I got home and I went to Esso in Thames House North, the mill bank. And I said, I'd like to become on board one of your ships. And that would save me doing national service, but I could study. Mm. And perhaps I could play cricket. So for four years, I, well, first off they said, yes, we'd like, we'll, we'll, we'll employ you, but you, 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 have to have been at, you, you have to get a seaman's book. And to get a seaman's book, you have to have been at sea. I said, I've been at sea. I said, I've got a paper. Oh, that's okay, we'll give you a job. So they, they, the first thing they did was fly me to New York. So here comes my first transatlantic flight in 1958. Wow. And it was, took 19 hours and four stops. And the four stops, were, we took off from Blackbush Airport, which is down the A30. Now it's a racetrack. Yeah. Um, we had three attempts to take off because there were flames coming out the engine, which I'm watching. And the captain said, well, we, if we don't do it this time, we have to stay. Anyway, we got off and then we landed in Presswick. Keflavik was a, a US Army place. And, and I remember the greasy sausages. It was probably about four o'clock in the morning, horrible. <coughs> and then we went to Bangor, Maine and then to Idlewild. And it took 19 hours. Idlewild, people say, where's Idlewild? Well, it, it's actually called JFK today, but that was before John F. Kennedy was assassinated and so that's how my first trip started and for the next six months I went up and down the American coast picking up oil from Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela, taking it to Rio, taking it to BA, taking it to Charleston, taking it to New Jersey. For a 16, 17, 18 year old as I was then, almost anyway, it was Bonanda. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are many places like Curacao and Aruba. Wow. <laughs> I was in Havana when, before Castro. Um, and the sign of the lawyer was going to take over. So there's how I started my travel and my air travel. And I think I got injected by the travel bug, yeah. you know. <laughs> and ever since, I was flown out back and forth many, many times. And on one, and one occasion, the ship took off while we were ashore. And we were in Long Island. And uh, I said, the, the police said, well, you're in trouble now, you, your ship's gone. I said, no, we didn't know it went. So we had three weeks in Long Island in a place called Mattituck, right on the end of Long Island. Fabulous. So I said, America's for me. So this is forming my life and it's going ahead. I didn't know it at the time. Mm. Anyway, we got back on the ship and there was no problem. And eventually I finished my studies and while I was finishing my studies in London, back in London, I parked cars at casinos at night. A pair of shoes clubs and then Bob Guccione opened the penthouse club. So I would park cars until four o'clock in the morning. And you know, you could earn a hundred pound a night. It's a lot of money then. Well, it was. <laughs> so I, I lived in, uh, in Balcom Place, did my study, and went to park cars in the evening. And a, a, one of the punters there, said, you're wasting your time here. Why don't you come to Canada? By which time they'd moved me from parking cars to be concierge. And being concierge in a, in a nightclub was a whole new experience, but a, a, a gifted one in a way, because they'd come along, you remember my table, don't you? And there'd be a 20 pound note in it or something, mm, yeah? Mm -hmm. Oh yes, of course, sir. Mm -hmm. So it was a money maker and an education in hospitality. So one day I said, well, okay. And I got on a flight in November to Toronto, but through New York and it was snowing. And I called this guy, Steve Hershoff. 
And I said, I've taken your advice, Steve. I said, I'm coming to see you. He said, when's that? I said, about two hours. <laughs> he, said, he said, thanks for the warning. <laughs> so the guy picked me up and he took me to his beautiful house. And he was an older guy, but he'd married Miss Australia. And uh, I stayed with him for a month, by which time I looked for a job and I found a job at the time when everybody has a down, they said, oh, it's not a good time to find a job. Everywhere you go, it's never a good time to find a job. Mm. I gave myself six months to find the right job. I had 32 job offers and eventually that company moved me to New York. When I got to New York, my, I was on the 26th floor and there was a little car down there called the Oldsmobile Cutlass. He says, it's a European, that's your car. There's four, $400 a week in your bank account. There's a credit card. There's this little pump. I would like you to show it to motor factors and hospitality distributors in every city in America. Off you go. So it took me 17 weeks. And I, I mean, it was great. I was 20 odd years old and I've got a car. I'm getting paid to drive around America. <laughs> and, and, and you know, on the social side of life, it was, oh, honey, we could listen to you talking all, night, all, all day. I said, well, sometimes it's available all night as well, if you want. That's another question. You want a bit <laughs> well, we, were grow, we were growing up, right? <laughs> so there's where it started. And then they developed a project. It was instead of painting a van, they did magnetic. So you could have a van or a car, mm. could be a business, you could take it off at night. So they said, Fred, we well, think this will work in the UK. I said, give me two. I flew over Friday night to Heathrow. I walked up Staines High Street and took four orders and came back and said, yes, it would. So they had me set up a plant in London, Highgate. We rented this massive house and this is what we made. So I started that business in, in the UK. And then I was commuting back and forth to the States. And for four years, um, because of this business, from my office in, in New York, I flew every Friday night to London, worked on Saturday morning. Now I went to the casino that I used to work for and they made me an honorary member at the Penthouse Club and a pair of shoes club. And flew back and I'd have lunch at the pub on Sunday and fly back to my office on Monday. For four years I did that, nonstop. Yeah. And eventually uh, I got headhunted by a, a company in New Jersey and it was okay. It wasn't what I really wanted. But in the meanwhile, I got another offer in Connecticut. And then the next day, I got a, a phone call from the chairman of Hasbro asking me if I'd like to come and meet him in New York. I said, fine. And he said, we've, we've selected you to do our licensing program worldwide. I said, you know, Harold, he was called. I said, it's just what I want. Unfortunately, I accepted another job yesterday. Oh, he said, "May I ask you, he said, who it was with? And I told him, he said, you know, Fred, we want you. They're one of our best suppliers, and I'm sure they want to remain that way. <laughs> Can I talk to them? He did, and I started working for Hasbro the next day. Wow. And from then on, I traveled 11 months of the year, put in international licensing agreement, because I qualified in MBA in international law, and the licensing was, that's what it was about. And I had to work with American law, with ministers of, the ministers of trade, finance, and then uh, private companies that work all that together under, under US law and national law. And I worked with third world companies that didn't have foreign exchange, mm. but this gave them the ability to sell or make for themselves in a country where they didn't have to spend foreign exchange. So it took about three years to put one of these together. It was a very new project then. Now everybody builds in yeah. this country. That's how I started. Amazing, gosh. And you were 18 years, Hasbro, you were telling me last night, wasn't it? Yeah. 18 years, so quite a long time with that one organisation, but I guess so much variety. All well, I did. I went countries. with them until was, I could do no more for them. Yeah. By which time, the travel world had overtaken me mm. because Concorde came out. In 1976, the 25th of May, I flew my first flight. Now, living in America, I didn't know much about Concorde. And in what Washington does, the, there's no gates. So you go into the lounge and they, they drop the lounge down and take the lounge to the aircraft. And I could see this shape 
and it was Concord. And, well, it obviously looked different. And they put me in seat 9A. I don't know why, but that's what they did. It became my seat there in th thereafter. Mm. And uh, first off, it was a very different experience. The captain is telling you what you're about to see and what you're not. Uh, and, but it's, as, as, as though it's not heady enough, you always get a whiff of aviation fuel, just briefly, mm. as they turn on the air conditioning and stuff. Wow. And you're invited to the flight day. And I met those two captains many times, and, and then I ended up playing cricket for the Concord cricket team. And do, I used to stand in for captains and doing talks about Concord. I did the, they, they used to go one way on QE2 and one way on Concord for half a Concord fare. I mean, the, the first class on the QE2 and for half the fare of Concord, it was brilliant. Mm. And I would do the lectures about to the Americans who were going on the ship. It was many Americans. and. Uh, I talked to them about what would happen on Concord, and uh, I got a call from the captain's office. Mr. Finn, he said, what are you doing? Have we got a problem with you? And then he winked at me, and he said, you know, you're, con you're contracted to do two talks, but everybody can't get in. So would you do it every day for us, and you can sit at my table? And that's happened, and because of that relationship, it was the Red Arrows and a Concorde flyby of the QE2. I was on the bridge of the QE2 with Concorde in one ear, the Red Arrows in another, and telling the passengers what was going on. Amazing. And that was an iconic photograph. So this is how it, it, it caught up with me, the travel industry. And then they wanted to know, who was this guy flogging pencils flying on Concorde? Because <laughs> it was a lot of educational equipment we did. Because, do you know, in every flight deck there was a pencil. Um, and people use at school. And pencils, the, the normal, you can get a splinter in your eye, the lead drops out. This is a totally new development that didn't take trees. So we licensed it around the world until I could do no more with it. And by then, the travel industry have overtaken me. I was a consultant to Executive Travel Magazine with travel tips, how to pack, mm. how not to pack, how to pack a bottle. And uh, I can tell you this little story about packing, if you don't mind. Go for it. Because people say to me, well, t tell us how to pack a bottle. I said, well, there's always a shortage of toilet rolls when I stay in a hotel, and it's not for obvious reasons. You see, the shape of a bottle is there, and it just happens to fit the toilet roll. And that's the bit that breaks. So you put it on the toilet roll and put it in a sock. And I've taken 10 bottles because they give me this when I'm in Georgia, through three airports and not one is broken. And my wife said, this is a lot of rubbish. I'll pack the bottle and one, hers broke. So that's, <laughs> that, that's a, Told you so. <laughs> this is, but the, these are the travel tips, yeah? Mm. I always pack my suits in the, the, the dry cleaners bag because it keeps a bit of air in mm. and they don't crease. You know, I travelled in this suit all day yesterday because there was a train problem mm. and it doesn't crease. Yeah. And it, it's just little tips. And I use hard-sided luggage that's flexible. And Samsonite I, I've used, the, the last place I've got, it weighed at one and a half kilos. The top case, which now Samsonite owns, weighs six kilos. They gave me one. It's a thousand pounder case. Mm. But what can I do with a case that weighs six kilos before I put anything in it with the, the, the restrictions you've got on luggage today? Yes. So, yeah. so Samsonite works for me. And now I'm just going to give them the case back. It's done over three or four million miles. They oh. can put it in their museum. They send me another one. Fantastic. So this is about packing. How do I, I see, and I don't believe in jet lag. I think jet lag was invented by our airline crews to get days off and, 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 and on nice destinations. Because I don't get it. And you don't get it in Concord. In three and a half hours, you're through the same time zone. So why would you get it doing something else? And see, for me, it's dehydration being in an aluminum tube. The new aircraft, like the 787, the air doesn't come through the engine anymore. It's it's lower, so it's it's better for fly, it's better for your health. But I think if you spray your skin with, with water uh, and take a nap every now, just 15 minutes to moisturise your eyes, and you'll mm. be fine. I rarely watch the in-flight movie, and if I do, I lip read. Sends me to sleep for an hour. Yeah, <laughs> and all these crazy things I do. Um, like my aerial atomicity, it's by clenching your muscles and, and keeping the blood flow going. Yeah. 
it's healthy it's and simple. Yeah, absolutely. You have to, sorry. And, and how many, so, so you've done, correct me if I'm wrong, Fred, 718 flights on Concorde. Yes, I Is have. that right? Yeah. Incredible. And, and during that time, so you're obviously flying Concorde, and sometimes, how, how often would you fly Concorde in a, in a day? Because I heard that you did three, three I did once. flights on one day. Yes, I mean, and, it was, and it wasn't a PR stunt, you know. <laughs> it, no, it wasn't. And uh, I think there's two people in the world have done that. There was a guy that, Owns this car that they're making. He's from Guildford. They're making the, the, the car that they're doing the world record. Okay. The, the Red Arrow pilot oh, yes, flight. Yeah? yeah. But for me, my chairman said, "I want this signed." So I went from London to New York. Signature came back from here, got it, and back again. And um, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. It was. I spent an hour and a half on the ground in London, in 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 London and New York, and the guys were there to meet me, so it was it was easy. Amazing. But it's. Um, there was no mobile phones of any substance there. No, I mean, when they did, they were the size of a brick. Mm. And I was endorsing the phone company, and I, and I gave one to people that they wanted me to give them away. So I gave one to Richard Branson at House Brick. And Penny Pike, his PA, she called me up and she said, he'd lost it again. <laughs> How did he lose a brick? <laughs> so we'd give him another one. And then he would call, my number was double three double three three one, And he'd miss dial and dial all the threes and the chairman's number. And he said, uh, Colin Davis, he said, by the way, he said, this is your answering service, Richard wants to talk to you. He missed out it again. <laughs> but we had a close relationship. Well, let's talk, about, let's talk about Richard, because, I mean, you know, travel, the travel industry, you can't talk about the travel industry without talking about Richard Branson. Not really. You know, because he's such, a, such an inspiration with, with what he's done with Virgin, etc. So how did you first come across Richard, and, and how has your relationship with him evolved over all these years? Because yes. you're still close to him today, aren't yes, you? Yes, I mean, pick up the phone yeah, we, we, we talk when we have to. I mean, mm. he... I don't believe anybody really knows Richard Branson any more than they knew Colin Marshall. They, they, I mean, if it's not on one piece of paper, he's it, lost with it. He mm. doesn't have a, a, a long attention span. And dyslexic as well, right? Yes. yes. So I was coming home from Concord, and I was lucky they gave me a pass on the New York helicopters. So I'd fly over to, to Newark, and my driver would pick me up to take me home. And this guy walked up to me, he said, are you Fred Finn? I said, I am. He said, good. He said, Richard Branson wants to have lunch with you. I said, okay, I'll be back in London in three or four days time. Actually, it's tomorrow. I said, well, how does that work out? He said, well, we've got a flight leaving in an hour and we've got a seat on it for you. I said, how long do you know this? He said, all day. I said, well, if you called me four hours ago, I could have just stayed in London. <laughs> so I flew back and I went into a hotel he said, didn't you leave? I said, yeah, I've been there and back. It doesn't matter, you know, it's what we are. And Richard sent a car for me. And he had his chef, a lady chef, on his houseboat in Pimlico. And I spent four hours with him. And basically, at that time, first class for the corporate market was getting too expensive. And there wasn't such a thing as business class then. It mm. was the two classes born. And so upper class was born. And at the time, I would suggest that it was probably better than a lot of airlines first class. Mm. It was really good. Um, it was upstairs to start with. They had the bar. Even, I think, a piano at one point in time. Mm. And it gave you a limousine at each end or a railway ticket. Um, you had a bigger seat. Uh, it was first class. In fact, it was so good that British Airways came to evaluate it and they left all their paperwork on the flight. So the next day, even British Airways thinks we're good. Yeah, it's true, <laughs> that is. Uh, so, so, yes, and I did all the inaugurals with him and his, his parents. And uh, I ended up playing cricket for his cricket team in, 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 in Santa Monica. And Sealbury Smith was an English cricket captain before the war. And I don't ever know why you've got a thing named after him in, in, uh, in Santa Monica. But we played there against the Los Angeles Dodgers, or baseball or netball team. They were big, tall guys. Mm. Of course, they were more active than cricketers. And we had the world middleweight champion running up, I'm going to get you. It was quite a deal. Pamela Anderson played with us. I mean, no, <laughs> played in the same team with us. <laughs> but she did change with us as well. Of course, this was love the guys, loved that. But uh, yes, 
and, and uh, up at Richard's house in, near Oxford. Um, I did my 10 million mile flight with Virgin Atlantic and we had the first Toastmaster in the air and sprayed everybody with champagne. It was fun. Mm. And then the hotel, they had it all done like cats. And Richard wanted to stuff dry ice down my shirt. And I said, no, not the dry ice, please. <laughs> but we're cooking prawns together. And it was, it was a good trip. And yeah. uh, BBC covered it and ITV. We got 20 minutes on Good Morning most mo for, for a week. He got the best advertising he ever had for free. But of course, this is why he did the stunts. Mm, he yeah. did. He didn't have the money to take on these, the PR things that he did. So sure. that's why he did it. So he was pleased with that. And I'd take him the video and, and he'd get his daughter who was there to put it on for him. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. So, yes. And I spent a lot of time with him. And I, I, I never became a, a paid employee of Virgin at the time because I was still working. Mm. So I, I became a consultant to them. And I said it was a shame that the big airlines always won the Airline of the Year award. So I got executive travel to, say, to do it like a horse race and with a handicap. And I made sure that executive travel was on Virgin flights. And I told the girls, make sure people vote for you. Mm. So I'm sitting at the Airline of the Year awards. John King is here and Richard Branson is here. And I'm in the middle when it announced that Virgin Atlantic won. Woo! That was quite something. I can imagine, yeah. But it, I think it, it was deserved. Mm. He ran a good service. It was as good as it gets. And at a business class price. Mm. It, was better than, it was really better than a lot of airlines first class. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Virgin, like everything else, has changed and changed and changed. They'd, they'd sold off a lot of it to Singapore Airlines when Singapore wanted to go to New York from here. Mm. So they did a thing with Virgin Atlantic and when South African Airways couldn't fly to the States, I went down and negotiated a deal with South African Airways that they take all their passengers on to either Washington or New York. And Richard quite liked that deal. Um, yeah. And I, I got the British Airways manager from Terminal 3 and 4 to come with me on a Virgin flight to talk about the air, airline airport procedures. And we, well, they were a good airline. Um, but now it, Singapore Airlines can fly directly. So they, they sold it off to Delta for a very cheap price. And I think Delta runs 49%. That's right. They yeah. plugged a lot of 10% off to the KLM. Mm. Lot. I think he's bought that back. But if it wasn't for Delta, I mean, I know people that went from Pan Am to Delta very well. They said there, there was no back room. It was all brand and up front and the, the sort of flights they were doing were never going to make money. They said they were broke. Mm. So Delta has re-established that airline with, with a proper management structure and a back room. Now, people are not going to like that I'm saying that, but it was absolutely the truth. And the guy that, that ran the marketing, Jimmy, he's still, I think he's, he's probably 70 years old. He's still working for Delta. Mm. Um, but I know him from Pan Am days, yeah? So... Yes, and I, 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 I saw Richard there, they invited me on the inaugural to Atlanta on the 787 and it was a travel agent's flight and we had music being transmitted back to ground. Perfect. It, was, it would always be different with him, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I saw him and I said, well, I haven't seen you for some years and a couple of friends of mine came in, in from in Atlanta and, and, he's, and he said, well, it's okay. And I took him with his whole family on my safari. And so I had him for two weeks, Amazing. and I showed you the pictures with the lion lion. That was when we when we took over Tiny, and I can show you that there are seventeen lions in a in a, in a three acre place, and we they feed them. And Richard's fo photographing this one right as close as I am to you, and it pushed him, and he landed up on top of a Toyota Land Cruiser. <laughs> He said, let's put my son on that shoulder, Fred, and do it again. <laughs> so he was a daredevil as well, yeah? Yeah, fantastic. So he had a, you know, you're with somebody two weeks and you get to know them quite well. Absolutely, yeah. And we have a good relationship. If I need to go, I can send him an email or call his PA. Excellent. And I have, I'm not in his pocket every day. I'm not talking to him every day. Sure. There's no need for me to do that. But if I need to, I know how to get hold of him. And a lot of other people as well. Mm. But 
they're busy and I don't call up people. Hey, Richard, how are you doing? I miss you, you know, all this, this nonsense. <laughs> we'll have to get Richard on the podcast. That's what we'll have to do, because he's definitely a great example of brave, bold and brilliant, isn't he? Well, he is. Mm. Um, I think him, I don't know how much he owns of anything, but his brand is brilliant. Oh, absolutely. It, it's all about brand. Yeah, yeah. I mean, credit cards, banks, Everything. you name it. You name it. Let's, let's talk a little bit about Concord, because that's like a major part of your life 27 as well, years of it, or more years. now, yeah. So obviously, a lot of people will never have had the opportunity to fly on Concord, unfortunately, and will never have the chance, now that it's, you know, obviously decommissioned. You won't. No, no. Then you're going to be surprised. You're not going to actually fly in Concord, but you're going to do the next best thing. You're going to have a simulated flight, an actual simulator, and you're going to fly to New York on Concord. Wow. In a simulator. Uh, that's a promise I've made to you, live. Fantastic. Oh, gosh. Well, we'll definitely be having to record yeah, I, that I, one. I, I, I did it, I did, I'm interrupting you, I know, but I, if I don't tell you, I'll forget. I went to the amalgamation of Sheraton and Marriott, and the lady came up to me, she said, I saw you on television, I like your concord. Can I have a photograph with you? And we're talking away and talking away. And then she left, and I said, who was that? He said, President of Marriott. And she said to me, I, I'd never flown on, on Concord, and just like I said to you, mm. I'll do that. And so I, I called back in and I said, I've got a little presentation I want to give to you because there's only one photograph ever taken of Concord flying supersonic. And my friend was the official photographer, so I got it mounted. And I said, your attitude at Marriott starts at the top. Because she said, I like what you write about us. So I, I went to present it to her. And they said, she's businesslike, it will be very formal, there won't be any flippancy. Okay, so I'm waiting in the office. She comes and put her arm around my shoulders and said, thank you, what can we do for you? Oh, and yes. I took her to fly on, on a simulator. And we flew her under the Verrazano, Verrazano Narrows Bridge. And it's, and it's like, you, 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 it's really, really, it's a real simulator with a real Concord captain to fly you. Wow, that'll be and incredible. And it's as good as it gets. And then you sit in the back, you can feel it taxiing. To bring you the champagne and the flower, and you feel it taxi in, you feel it take off, you can see the magneto, and it has all the effects of a live flight, except you don't go anywhere. But it's the best I can get you now. But <laughs> I'll it, take it. But it, is, it is good. <laughs> That's so, amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. So, so oh, honestly, that that Fred, you are an absolute hero. You really are. Um, and I, I feel really privileged to have had the chance to meet you. And it's, it's, it's thanks to David Scousel, actually. I've got to oh, give yeah. a My big dear, shout out to our, friend, yeah. our friend David for introducing us in the first place. And, um, and it's, it's amazing. When you meet someone, it, sometimes you just click. Um, and that's how I feel, having, having met you. It's absolutely mutual. I say. It, it, it either does or it doesn't, but it's fantastic. Yeah, Lovely. exactly. And, and, and really, I'm excited to have met you. You're an amazing lady who has done so much for women, and women are so overlooked in the business world that you have to be above everybody else to succeed because men are not treated on the same level. And this is a man talking to you now. Yes. Uh, I have lots of beautiful lady friends, and, oh, it's going to get me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> I think that they're so much more intellectual than men. Mm -hmm. They have so many more interests to talk about than men. And so it, it, it's natural that I'm having this excitement and fun and professionalism to talk to you. It's all, it's all encased in the same thing. I am so happy to David. David is, a, is, is, a, is an amazing, humble person. And I know nobody that knows as much about tourism as he does, but yeah. he's, a, he's a good guy. He is, very much so. So a big thank you to David for introducing yeah, David. us. 100% David, hope when you're listening to this. Um, but just going back, Fred, so that, that sort of feeling of being on Concord, and you described a little bit around the, around the sort of the, the being on the, on the simulated version, but if you were to describe what it was like for you, sitting in that seat, 9A, just give us a little bit of, yeah, a, of an absolute, emotional some flavor, connection yeah, yeah. to well, it, because I think it's hard for people to imagine. I really. think that's true, and it, it, it is. Um, as I said, the first time was on when I was in DC, Washington, and we went out to the aircraft and I sat in seat 9A. It so happens that seat 9A was the first seat served by the galley at the back. <laughs> So I got served first. <laughs> There's methods which, to the madness. It wasn't so bad. I mean, I didn't know anything about this at the time. Yeah. <laughs> but then 
The first flight, of course it was exciting. The announcements were different. We're now going to go through the sound barrier. And I read different people's um, description. It's like being in a Formula One car and all of a sudden it hits you in the back. But it doesn't. That's all you feel. Oh. It doesn't spill a drop if you've done Berignan. And it won't turn over a pound coin if you stand it up. And that's how smooth it is, how, how designed this aircraft was. And the first pilot I flew with Norman Todd and Brian Calvert. And Brian Calvert, until he died, we had a great friendship. And uh, of course, they invited everybody up to the flight deck. And it's a long flight deck. I mean, it's from here to the door, and then it opens. And it's very small but it has an engineer's column. The engineer probably is, as, if not more important than the actual captain because the plane is balanced by moving fuel around. Mm, so when okay. they're taking off, they move it to the back. When they're flying, they move it to the wings. And Concorde, uh, of course, uh, going from London, you get down the Bristol Channel and you've, 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 you've taken the afterburners off. Now, fight is the only aircraft that, apart from fighters that have afterburners and it's a, like a ring of, a gas ring at the end. Mm. And they're lighted up and excess fuel is burned off. And it's noisy, like a, like a gas in your oven, you know, if right. you turn it on, it full well. Yes. And uh, it gives 20% extra thrust. And that extra thrust gets you through the sound barrier. And then they keep it on to a 1.71 Mach. And then by this time, Concorde it's given free space from 39,000 feet up onwards, wherever it fly at. But Concorde doesn't ever fly level. It's on a cruise climb. As it burns off fuel, it climbs. Depending on how cold it is, is how high it's going to go. Mm. So it's normally between 55 and 60,000 feet. And then possibly an hour and a half is as much as you're going to fly supersonic. From the time you take off, mm. because you're in a circle route, until you have to come down to 39,000 feet to, to enter US airspace. It's the only aircraft in the world where you take off in the night, go to the west, and the sun comes up from the west and you land in daylight again. You've beaten the, the time of zone, the mm -hmm. turn end of the earth. And you're flying at 23, mi 23 miles a minute. That's quite, you can work that out. Isn't it like 1,300 miles an 1, hour? 1,350, yes. Yeah, something like that. Gosh. I've actually talked to the Concorde coming, because they used to set me with the headphones on, and I'd talk to the pilots. Mm. And they said, talk to David, he's coming the other way. So that's Captain David Leaney on the inbound Concorde, and I'm talking to him. And we're doing 46 miles a minute. We're doing 3,000 miles an hour closer, closing speed, yeah? Wow. And I asked the captain, the sound, a sound barrier, the speed of sound, does it cancel each other out when we're talking like this? No, he said, it's got nothing to do with it. Sound travels at the speed of light. I said, you lost me already. It's too, too technical <laughs> oh for me. Because yes. what then is a sound barrier? Light barrier? No, it blew my mind. Yeah. But yeah. these are the sort of things I did with Concord. Because I was there every other week or every week or sometimes twice a week. Because my company allowed it, and I must to say, an American company allowing me to fly on a British aircraft, and especially that one, mm. it, I had to be doing either something right, <laughs> or it was a, a pound saver, for, or a dollar saver for them, and it actually it was a dollar saver for our company. Yeah. How does that work out? Well, leaving New York at nine o'clock in the morning, I'd, I'd be here by six, with the time change which meant that evening I can fly to, to Nairobi, to, to Johannesburg, wherever I want, Lagos, mm. Middle East, Far East, without go coming out of the airport, without going to a hotel, 24 hours later coming back again, and much better for my health. Mm. So that saves a couple of hundred quid, probably, for hotels, driver, and, and time. Time, yeah. I absolutely. think they used to build my time out about seven or eight hundred pounds an hour in those days, you yes. know. So that was quite a saving of time. And yes, and so I would leave New York in the morning, and the following morning I'd be in my office in Nairobi. Amazing. From that's quite 
and, and, and in those days you had to go through Europe to do this stuff, so why not use Concord? And it was what I did. Yeah, yeah. And because I did it so often, I became part of Concord. I played cricket, Brian Cover and arranged a cricket match down in his local. And his wife was related to Charles Dickens somewhere, and we, we had piano concerts in the evening. And they asked me to fill out, filling in uh, lectures for the Concord captains that couldn't make it. And he always got some wise guy. And I was doing one in St Albans, and a guy interrupted me, and he said, I want to tell you that your Concord is a gas guzzling, uneconomical, environmental. I said, Well, thanks for your information. I said, but first off, it's not my Concord. And secondly, can I ask what you do? He said, I'm a barrister, old chap. I said, well, that's very nice. Well, you're obviously not a barrister in St. Albans, are you? No, 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 in my office in the city. I said, can I ask, how do you get to the city then? I said, in my Jaguar. And I said, well, that's very nice because your Jaguar per person burns more fuel than my Concord. Hmm. But it's not my Concord, it belongs to British Airways. Yes. So everybody clapped and he sat down and we got on with what the rest of the day. <laughs> So I was disinformed with it. Yeah. <coughs> and when I walked on board, they said, you're going to sit up the front with us or you're going to sit in your own seat. Mm. And many times I would sit in the flight deck for the whole flight. And I've landed in London. Now, I used to have a deal with the crew. If a bottle was open, they could buy it for 50 pence, and it was the best, yeah? Now, I had an expanding briefcase. I could get 17 bottles in it. <laughs> It was quite heavy. So whoever met bottles of what, Fred? Cognac. <laughs> uh, Not seventeen which, bottles of water. Oh well, Christ! No, 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 they no. And the crew could take it, but yeah. of course they couldn't take it through customs. No. Yeah. Me, because if I was coming on the ten o'clock at night, Concord at landed, the customs gone home, mm. and they said, "There's an honour box. Would you put in?" Well, you don't declare open bottles, do you? No. no. So I'd walk. We all used to meet up. And uh, I'd hand it over. And they used to do the same for me in New York. Mm. And this is the close relationship I had. And well, Fred's with us today. And when, under my seat would be a, half a bottle in a kettle, ready for me in the seat in front. But, it, but before I bought it, it would be there. So having that relationship, mm. um, girlfriends occasionally, yes. Uh, very attractive, beautiful ladies, and, and I was free to do whatever I wanted anyway in that, in that, at that time because my relationship in the States had soured. Mm. And uh, I can honestly say that as long as I was in a relationship, a matrimonial relationship with my wife, I didn't do anything I should do because I got fed up with guys telling me I got too much love for one woman. And my response to that is, if you love one woman properly, you'd never have time for anything else, my yeah. friend, because it's a full-time job. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it really, it does. It's a, it's a full-time job. So yeah. these are the things that you learn through life. But Concord went on, and I suppose I'm not Lord This and I'm not the film star. So who was this guy flying Concord so regularly? And uh, I've been called an oil tycoon. Well, I did work for Esso once mm. as a deck boy and up to a second officer, yes. <laughs> but certainly I didn't need to be a tycoon to do that. Um, and all sorts of trader. David Frost told people I was a gun trader, arms trader, which got me a lot of problems because then I got searched frequently. Wow. And David was always ticked off because he thought he was the most travelled person on Concord. And I had a good relationship with him. I mean, but he'd always sit right up the back. And there was a little guy who used to come on with a fiddle from South Africa who owned an airline and a track. And he'd go and play it to David, who used to get really frustrated with this guy. And I met him later on in, in Musselman's. I'm, I'm a founder member of Musselman's in London. And he would order cigars and put them on my account. I said, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> but he, he, I flew with him on a Virgin Atlantic. And I can never imagine to this day how the leading Catholic's daughter could marry a divorcee called David Frost. And he would say to me, have you met her ladyship? I said, is that her first name? No, she's a ladyship. I said, I'm American, David. I don't know what you're talking about. So I'm like, <laughs> and she says, well, she's the Duke of Norfolk's daughter. I said, oh, lovely. I played cricket there at Arundel once. So 
So he said, Fred, if you ever get anything you want to talk about, about airlines and stuff, I'm, I'm your man. I said, David, you stick with what you do, you do it sensationally well, and let me do the airline stuff, okay? I'm, I'm at it, yeah? Mm. So we used to have this sort of friendly <laughs> relationship. <laughs> it was a bit of competition, I don't, I don't, and it wasn't Ill, Ill mannered or anything, you mm. know? Yeah. I think we respected each other. But Concord was a club. I used to sit next to Lou Grade, and he'd give me one of these telegraph poles called a cigar. And I said, Lou, I'm, I'm not old enough to smoke one of them, and I can't even pick it up. <laughs> and he told me, you know, to be successful, you need a bed in your office and have a nap at every two o'clock. And he was Jewish, and he married a Catholic, and that's why he did Jesus Christ Superstar. He told, I got all this stuff. Mm. And Paul McCartney would draw funny faces. Um, one Christmas day, because British Airways didn't fly on Christmas Day in those days, so I was in Paris, and Air France for years told me, come to Paris, have a night out, and do whatever you want, and go with our aircraft. I said, why do I fly Concorde? Because it's quicker, yes? Well, if I come to Paris, it takes longer. And then I've got to get there, so there's not a lot of point. But Christmas Day was fine, so there were three passengers, and it was all decked out, and three passengers, and one of them took out his guitar and played Country Road for me, and yes, it was John Denver. Wow. And it's one of my favorite songs of all time. So it was just, and then the, the reason Concord stopped, basically, was Air France. You would have thought the cuisine would have been better, and the haute couture would be better, but it wasn't. The, the food on British Concord was better than anybody else's, and the way they were dressed was fabulous. And the passion by the crew was much better than the French. Initially, I think that they changed the crews to, from designated Concorde to, to a whole range of aircraft. They did it with the British one. They put it on short haul. And it went to the TriStar fleet, which was OK. Mm. But then they put them on the short haul. So a girl would go to Pizza one day and New York the next, because it was a three-hour flight. So you, they brought a short haul mentality to Concorde, and I don't think it ever was as nice mm. as it used to be. But the people I met, John Denver, uh, I flew with Michael Jackson, we mentioned just now, mm. Bruce Springsteen, they used to say, how, how, they used to say, how many flights Fred done now? So the guy in British says, well, yes, I did. I'll see you later, he said. And Joan Rivers, I flew with, with her several times, an amazingly, a talented lady and she said Fred I had a photograph that I'll bring for you so I said okay so about three flights later I saw her and she said there it is your photograph and signed and gave it to me oh, Muhammad Ali yeah. we flew with him we had some photographs with him um, but because it was Concord I possibly I'm only a human being you know, uh, you know I don't control AT&T &T or ITT but on that flight because I was there I was entitled to be there, and everybody was entitled to be there, so all the barriers were down. Had I tried to reach some of these people on the ground, it never would have happened. No. But I was saying, I, 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 after the flight, Ken Thompson, who owned Thompson, would ask, can, can I come and talk to you? What ideas have you got? And um, lots of people like that. So it was a leveller then, it almost oh, absolutely. all, all the it was sort a club. of social differences it or money gone. just all disappeared because everyone was on that flight, everyone deserved to be there for their own reasons. But it was entitlement, yes. I mean, yeah. if, if you were, could afford to be there, you were part of the club. Yeah, absolutely. And, and most of us were regulars. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hello Fred, how are you doing? <laughs> and, and, Incredible, and, isn't it? It was, and, and on, oh, on right. the celebratory flights they would announce and some guy come up and say, well, well, that's a whole lot of money you spend on here, you know. And it's just, yeah, come on through, no problem. Uh, so, uh, so, so talking about um, one of my absolute heroines, shall we say, is Dolly Parton. Oh, lovely. Now, I know you have met Dolly. Yes, so I'm can sure. you tell us some stories about Dolly? And this is a special shout out for my friends Anna, Karen and Claire, because we all go to see Dolly a few times. She's so lovely. She's, she's, she's one of the most lady. talented people you could ever wish to meet. And a very savvy businesswoman as well. Oh, she, she oh Christ, yes. No, 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 no fear of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but she, 
She came from a family in the backwoods. Probably with very little electricity and very little. Yeah, and 12, yeah. I think 12 of them in the family That's or something right. like that. So the first time I met her, she had gone to she'd London. She got off the plane and she'd given it all this, you know. So I flew with her. I'd been to Rome for lunch and I came back and I flew with her. And I flew with her subsonic because we were going on to Nashville, yeah? Knox, Knoxville, she called it, yeah? Mm. And uh, she told me dirty jokes for nine hours. <laughs> See, it was really amazing. <laughs> she had me in, I mean, I saw ribs I had. And I think her sister was sitting in the back. So we got off and we then flew down to Nashville together. And she, she said, you all come around. And she, she gave me a dress and everything and in contact. And I did see her a couple of times, but you know, it's years yeah. since that happened. But we, we could st I could still be in contact because she would remember, mm. as would Bruce Sprinting, we spent time together. And Johnny Cash was my hero. And Talk about Johnny a little bit. Well, again, I met him on a flight mm. from Nashville to, to New York. And we're sitting there and he's sitting next to me and he, he's a big guy and, and, and he's black and mm. everything's bright red inside. And, Fred, are you all right? He said, Fred, I got to get me to Dennis tomorrow. Uh, I said, I said, do you want to go out and have a uh, some date tonight? And he said, yeah, you get me a good bit eye or something. I said, I can take you to the best. So I said, I'll go home and I'll come and pick you up from your apartment, the apartment in Central Park South. So I picked him up and we went to 63rd and 3rd, where this little restaurant used to be. And I told some friends of mine, you come and meet JC if you want. And they did. Through the door, it was that thick or this thick. Cut it with a fork. So I did that with him on quite a few occasions. Um, and then the last time over the years, I flew with his wife. It's probably the mainstay of that family. I think John went through very bad times. But when he married June Carter, she picked him up because she discovered uh, master guitarist um, Clint, oh, Clint Eastwood, I was going to say Clint, uh, Chet Atkins, right. um, who recorded the Beatles mm. in Nashville and was the head of the studio, an utter gentleman. I also flew with him and so humble. But uh, she, she put him back on track. And, you know, the man sold 60 million records, so he couldn't be all that bad. Mm. But a human being, yes. And she came across, she's sitting, uh, uh, sitting across there, she said, you, are you all right, Fred? I said, yeah. She said, can I just come and sit next to y'all? So we're sitting and talking, just like I'm talking to you. And that's how people react to you, especially country music. Mm. They're at least affected. Um, just great people. So she was telling me that I better come and see JC and this and the other. And can you, can you write a note to him? So I wrote on a bottle of Concord red wine. I had one bottle with me and I wrote, and, and I come and see you in Hendersonville where he lived and da 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 da. And then I got on the flight and I said, I just sent a nice bottle of wine to a reformed alcoholic, which was, which was a shame because he wouldn't have drink, drunk it, you know, it, it, no. wouldn't, it was definitely off it. Yeah. But it's these sort of people, legends in my mind, mm. but when you meet one-on-one, -on -one, listen, you're a legend in your own business and what you do, you know it for it. I'm what I am, and I'm known for that too. Mm. But it doesn't stop us being normal people, enjoying friendship and having a laugh together. Laughing is a big tonic. I do inspirational talks to hospitality, and the little girl in this hotel, Morgan's Hotel, I'm staying in him, in Swansea, which is part of the old Port Authority buildings that they've redone here into the most amazing style. Um, <coughs> suites are named after ships that used to trade from here. Mm. And I'm, I'm in the suite called Raja of Sarawak. And <coughs> it's homely, it's a magnificent building, Fantastic breakfast this morning. I don't get full English anywhere else. But. <laughs>
Oh, black pudding. <laughs> so I have to try it when I'm away. But Full Welsh. Oh, Welsh. Full Welsh breakfast. Full Welsh breakfast. <laughs> yeah, got to, remember, got to remember I crossed into a foreign country. That's there right. Because I, so, I can't read the writing, so it, it must, must be foreign. <laughs> but it's, there was a little girl here. She's just starting in the hospitality trade and uh, called Elisa. I don't know, probably she's 18 years old or something. Mm. She, I don't know. But she has a smile as big as Buckingham Palace. And she welcomed me. She was the first person I saw when I walked into the hotel. And I took the time, because I think people like that should be commended. Most people don't bother, they, 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 don't, ha they don't know how to train people like this. It's just, they tell them what it should be. Mm. But I told her, your smile is brilliant, your attitude is fantastic, and you'll go a long way in this business, and I wanted to come and tell you that. And who am I? Well, I slept in 7,000 hotel beds, so I've got probably the hang of it by now. And I did that because I wanted that girl to have encouragement. Because I know people that started in w as waiters are now CEOs of hospitality companies. Mm. And I know one in Kenya, Gerson, who started Carnival as a waiter, he's now chairman. But my friend Martin, he, he employs Kenyan management, and they're, they're talented people, given the opportunity and the training. Mm. And a lot of places in, in, in our empire, they weren't given that opportunity. But in Kenya, they're bright people, and, and my, my friends did that. And, and I think uh, I'm staying here, I've met the management here, right? And they, they laugh. They're proud. You get a feeling that people are proud to be working here. Yeah. The attitude is about, it's all about attitude, this life. Um, if you think the world is what owes you, you're not going very far. Because the world doesn't owe you. If, you, if you're working and everybody whether they admit it or not, takes a wrong turning. I took lots of wrong turnings because it's my lifestyle. But, and including marriages, I took long turnings. I screwed up. That probably as much my fault as their fault. But you still have to, have to pick yourself up after losing everything. And, and when you get divorced in America, I, I walked away from a two and a half, well, a briefcase and a bottle of Dom Perignon. It's all I saved from my Concord collection. And I was homeless. So you pick yourself up and you learn from it. Well, hopefully. But you, you, the one thing they can't take away from is what you've got here. They can take everything, all your worldly goods away. They can take everything away, but they can't take away your brain and your knowledge and your experience. Yeah. And, and if you can use that and pick yourself up. If you go on a wrong turn, you can pick yourself up. You can make it the right turn. And, and you can see I'm getting wound up here about it. Cause I'm no, I, I think I 100% agree with you because I think so often we don't talk to, uh, as much about the things that don't go so well. We, you know, it's very easy to, to say, oh, you know, Fred, you're the most travelled man in the world and you've done 718 flights on Concord. But it hasn't been easy for you either. You've, no, had, you've been, had highs and lows and I think it's yes, important it, to talk I've, about I've had them. failed marriages because, yeah. of, because of my lifestyle. But it was what I did and they knew this before they came into my life. And, and certainly before they came into my life on a permanent basis. Mm. But they, they, whether they thought they would change me, well, changing me from travel is like me cutting my throat. Yeah. I, I don't know what, I, 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 people say, are you retired? Are you gonna retire? I don't know what retirement means. I, I can't imagine being retired. What should I do, sit and watch television and watch the paint dry? <laughs> no, that's not my style, it's what I am. Yeah. I'm, I'm live and breathe travel. I live and believe what I do. I love talking to people such as you. You're one of the best, yeah. And you know, I keep telling you these things, not because it's a throwaway line, because I'm honored to be on your show and I'm proud to meet you. You're an amazing young lady. Yeah. Oh, you see, I can call people young because I'm at least 30 years older <laughs> than you. Did, so so that, that tells you how old I am, doesn't it? But it's, it's all about attitude. And you, you've got an amazing attitude, and, and, and I think similar to mine in many ways, you're going to make it work. Because you're not going to let a machine or somebody beat you. Mm. Because you can do better. And this is the, the thing I do in my inspirational talks. You can do better. Mm. You can look after yourself. If you've got a goal, go for it. Maybe it doesn't work out the first time. Go for it. Because it will, because look at me. Where I'm sitting today, 
people want to talk to me, people want to come and say, can we do this and can we do that, or would you come and look at this and that? Yeah, of course. People now want to listen to my talks. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they wouldn't give a toss. Mm -hmm. But now I've got 63 years of knowledge of travel. Yeah. So even if I was the most stupid person in the world, I must have learned something. Yes, yeah. And so it's like traveling with the bottles of wine. How to pack with the toilet roll around the neck of the bottle. How to pack your clothes so they don't, they don't crease. Um, I always carry a scale with me. Always. Um, so, yes. And I carry a medicine kit with me. Uh, always with antibiotics, because if you've got deli belly, Antibiotics clears it up quicker than anything. Mm. And it's just little tips. Yeah. And, and, and my doctor gives me an emergency kit to travel with. Mm. You know, every time I go, I've got it. So it's, it's a whole lifestyle, of, I guess, what I am. Yeah. But packing, traveling. The Concorde gave me a different meaning in life. Not just a thrill, it was an absolute tool. It wasn't about setting a record, it was a tool to get my job done. Mm. And for 11 months a year I was traveling. And it would take me from Buenos, I'd fly Buenos Aires to Rio, Concord to Dakar to Paris, on to Tehran, back to London, and Concord to New York. And then start all over again. And pop into my office occasionally and talk to my chairman. Mm. And he really didn't understand me, my English, and the rest of the time I was traveling. But I was doing good business for him. Yeah, yeah. And so, yes.